Oh, fuck me. I really am doing a top ten list, aren't I? Jesus Christ. Okay, well, let's just get to it. I guess we'll start with number one, which is singletons. And these are basically scripts that don't really attach themselves to any existing node, which means they exist outside of the current scene, which makes them perfect for things like saving data, playing music uninterrupted between scenes, or preloading a bunch of resources to be used later. I have got, by my count, 14 singletons in warp tech as we speak, so I can tell you I really like using them, and for the record, that is way more than you should probably have. Okay, so number two, physics bodies, and this is close enough to be a tip, right? Let me just run through the three types of 2D physics body nodes and their usual use cases. So, kinematic 2D nodes are what I use for most things that need to be moved around, so enemies, the player, other colliding entities, I don't like bullets maybe, probably not bullets. Um, rigid body 2D nodes are good for physics based movements, so if you wanted some boxes for a puzzle game that move and fall like real boxes would, then you'd want to know, uh, or you'd want to use rigid body 2Ds, or you could use kinematic body 2D, but then you'd have to program all the physics stuff yourself and that's generally not so fun. Lastly, static body 2Ds are good for anything that should never move, like the walls or the floor. Easy enough, but it's good to know the differences between them. Number three, uh, adequate for number three, is the ternary operator. Uh, now, most programming languages have this one, and it's the question mark in C++, and in Python it's just the thing, if, condition, else, other thing. In GDScript it is the same as in Python, as most things tend to be, and it's super useful. I realise it's much nicer to just use this simple ternary operator on one line, rather than dedicating four lines to an if-else block. Now, number four. Here's a much more functional tip, and it's based off something I actually do in Warp Tech. Use a singleton script to preload all of the resources you need to use in the game uh, to speed up in-game performance. This way, if you want to instance a node, you just reference its entry in the monolithic resource script and instance it from there. It has, in my experience with preloading over 100 objects, maybe 150 even, made the game start up maybe half a second slower, but it drastically reduces lag spikes uh, that stem from having to repeatedly load or preload resources, such as when you're spawning a big blast of 30 to 40 bullets. Number five, specifying neighbors in control nodes. So have you ever run into the issue where you want a menu to be usable with the arrow keys or a D-pad, but Godot just won't direct to the buttons in the proper order? Well, I haven't really, because I haven't really considered keyboard accessibility until basically making this list, but there is a really neat solution to this problem. So any control node will have the focus category, and you can see there are a few properties like neighbor left, neighbor right, neighbor down, whatever. Uh, they basically determine what happens when this button is focused and the specified key is pressed. So in case this explanation wasn't perfectly clear, I won't go into too much detail. Um, I'd just say play around with it because it is a really simple concept and it's implemented really, really well. Number six, nine patch rects. Now this is also related to a control node, but trust me, this is super useful. And it's actually a thing that only just appeared in Godot 3. Basically, for Masochist, I had to manually assize and align all the edges and corners for all the menu panels and stuff. For Warp Tech, however, I've specified a 3x3 grid of what each corner, edge, and middle piece should look like, uh, loaded it into a 9-patch rect, and all you have to do is resize it, and it'll automatically scale or tile the corresponding parts of the graphic to fit a size as you're choosing. It's super convenient, and while it sometimes takes a moment or two to actually configure it, uh, it's definitely worth looking into. Number seven, have you ever had that issue where you're cooking pasta for a while and you stir it but you're kind of impatient and you think, well, this is probably good enough, and you strain it and you put it into a bowl and you take a bite and it's really crunchy in the middle so you put it back into water but you have to heat up the water again because you used cold water but by the time the pasta's boiling again, the pasta has actually dissolved into the water and you're left with a kind of starchy gloop that you just have to turn into a soup. But you don't even really like soups, so you just pour it out and then it blocks the drain because it's still really thick in places and then your sink overflows and instead of calling a plumber or even turning off the hot water tap, you just sit under the table crying and feeling malaiseful about your terribly out of control life while you wait for the small puddle of water on the kitchen floor to reach you and force you to even clean it up or deal with the soggy clothes. But when it does actually reach you, you just realise you don't have the energy or motivation to even get up off the floor for another hour and your clothes get completely saturated in warm starchy water and by the time you do get around to cleaning it up, you've done permanent water damage to that stack of important envelopes you've been meaning to pick up off the floor but never got around to. Oh, you've never had that one? Okay, never mind. Number eight. 
auto tiling. Now, of course, this one had to be on the list. It is a little tricky to get your head around initially, what with that bit mask stuff, but it's super useful once you do get the hang of it. Now, I won't explain it too much here, but trust me, learn it. It's useful. It'll take you, say, an afternoon at the absolute longest, and potentially even faster if you watch my lovely tutorial video, which I think exists. And usually, a better YouTuber would, you know, go back and check to make sure that video exists. But I guess, I guess not. Number nine, using an external code editor. Now, I did do this for about a day with Sublime Text before realizing that Godot's built-in code editor was fine for my needs, but if I had a strong preference, for instance, if I was a Vim or Emacs fanatic, then I would be in luck because Godot makes it super easy to use a third-party editor. All you have to do is go to Editor in the top left, Editor Settings, and under Text Editor, click External and configure to your heart's content. Now, lastly, number 10, which is the new audio bus system. Okay, and I don't think this really counts as a tip, I will admit it, but it's just something I really like about the engine, and you've got to agree, it's a step above whatever the fuck number 7 was about. Basically, I generally create two new buses in addition to the master bus, and I call them Music and Sound. Fairly self-explanatory, but the idea is that you route all the music and sound through the music bus and all the sound effects through the sound bus. Now, if you really wanted to, you could have buses for ambient sounds, voices, whatever. The point is that you can make things easier for you when you're adjusting system volume. You can make a nice volume slider that directly adjusts the volume of the music bus and another co that corresponds to the sound bus. Now, this stops you from having to save another variable like music volume and refer to it from any time you want to play some music. Anyways, that's about all that I've got for today. If you have any more interesting things about the engine that you think I and the world should know about, for real, let me know in the comments. I'm still learning stuff, and everybody watching my channel is still learning stuff, so keep it coming, kids. Uh, thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more top 10 lists, maybe. Uh, I guess probably not, though, because this was a pain and really long to write, so goodbye. Alright, so because I can't remember to self-promote to save my life, I have to add this bit on the end separately, so feel free to like the video, subscribe to the channel, or leave a comment, do all that stuff that's good for the YouTube algorithms, and by extension, me. Also, I have a Patreon, so you can get beta copies of Warp Tech for only $1 a month if you so desire. The link to that is, of course, in the description, you complete and absolute gremlin, people.